That was a wonderful talk by Professor Hawley. Um, I would also like to mention here that uh, this year, in March, Professor Hawley uh, got two prestigious awards, the Ramanujan Award for his book uh, on Surdas's songs, and also the James Todd Award. Now, there's an interesting connection here. Uh, Colonel Todd wrote the, the Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan, all the stories of the Rajputs. Uh, Swami Vivekananda read that book. And he used to tell those stories here. Often you find in the reminiscences of Swami Vivekananda how the American disciples here loved the stories of Ra Rajputana, of, of Rajasthan. And the main source that Swami Vivekananda had uh, was this Annals and Antiquities of uh, uh, Rajputana, written by Colonel Todd. So there is uh, the Todd Award, which is also given for work done on uh, Rajasthan, on Rajput culture. He, uh, Professor Hawley got that award also this year. So in March 2018, both awards Professor Rawley got. Um, now we have a chance to ask him questions. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Rawley. Uh, it was truly wonderful uh, getting this perspective on bhakti amidst the lovely reading and chantings you did along the way as well. Greatly appreciate it. <laughs> uh, my name is Sangeeta from New York. Uh, and uh, my question basically is about uh, the way we found, find a lot of modern scholars talking about bhakti. They tend to divide it into two parts, the intellectual or philosophical bhakti and the emotional one. There are also some references, um, you know, early references in Rig Veda uh, as a part of Agni Sukta, where they also talk about these two types of bhakti. Now, with your extensive learning and experience, uh, I'm curious to know what do you feel about these two types of bhakti and anything you might want to share on that? Well, uh, thank you, Sangeeta. Can you tell me what you would mean by intellectual bhakti? Um, from what I've read about the modern scholars' perspective, they talk about bhakti, the part of bhakti where it's a lot about the philosophy of it, the historical perspectives, and uh, so to say the knowledge about how things happen. And the emotional seems to be more about what one feels uh, as a part of maybe uh, an emotion expressed towards a per, you know, an object of affection or a, a person that you worship. Uh, not so much from the head, but more from the heart. <laughs> yes, right. Well, so, uh, yeah. As a species, to use that term again, we have this heart-head problem. It's just sort of wired hard into us. Um, yes, I suppose it would be true that there's a school of scholarship about bhakti that is concerned about what's usually called the philosophy of bhakti. So in that regard, it uh, bears on our discussion. I mean, you're reading Manduki Karika this week, but um, Ramanuja Chari would take a rather, he did not write a commentary on the Mandukya, for example, and would not have been his favorite one. So there, there are certainly philosophical disputes that relate to the matter of bhakti, or in regard to the Gita, the status of bhakti. Uh, in the text as a whole. Should it be read as a bhakti text, or as a jnana text, or as a karma text? Yes, there are those streams of scholarship, both on the part of um, non-Indians, like myself, but especially on the part of Indian scholars themselves. And then I'd be interested to know sort of how, your, how the scholarship on the emotional world of bhakti uh, comes to you. It certainly is uh, true and important that musical traditions, understanding the history of music and sort of the spreading of musical traditions, the way in which bhakti is enacted, also is a field of scholarship of its own. It also has historical dimensions, so that, for example, we have uh, studies about Drupad and the Dagar brothers and you know, all of what the Garanas are and so forth. And that, again, is a very interesting Sufi slash bhakti story, a very important story. Um, I suppose you're right that those tend to be two separate strands. What, uh, what I keep hoping in my own work is that both sides somehow would uh, speak to what I do. Thank you. Thank you. And let's note the fact that this is a question that came from Sangeeta, so we know which school 
you're most interested in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, you touched upon uh, the incident where uh, the Brahmin priest, uh, you know, uh, took a Dalit boy and acted that beautiful story. I thought I'll just mention here, uh, I was lucky enough to witness something like this, and that was in my early childhood, and it was my own paternal grandfather in a place called Ulal that's just like 100 kilometers from Shringeri, known from Shankaracharya's thing. Mm. And again, uh, a very hardcore Brahmin temple so far, but uh, I saw him break the rules and take Dalit, not on the shoulders, but by holding the hands. So it's been there, uh, spread across India, but just that's only a few make news. Thank you <laughs> very much. That's great. Congratulations on your grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's wonderful. I'll go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm Swami Sarva Priyananda. Uh, I'll I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> the question actually relates to the uh, to what you be uh, began your talk with, uh, with the story of the gospel, especially the Gospel of John, as against the Synoptic Gospels. Now. I understand this has been the historical perspective and, and the problem in um, Christian studies in the last 100 or 200 years where Bible studies has developed a lot over the last 100 or 200 years. And you've come up with this problem where historians seem to view Christ in one way by studying the Gospels um, uh, critically and a devout Christian would view Christ in another way. Uh, so, for example, no pastor would start his uh, um, sermon on the, on the Gospel of John by saying, um, Jesus said this, I and my father are one. But of course, he didn't actually say it. But anyway, we'll, we'll take it that he said it. So this leads to an uneasy uh, situation. Now, what I want to say here is, now, if you look at the life of Sri Ramakrishna, one advantage we have is it's very thoroughly documented. It was just in the last, uh, in, in the uh, 19th century. One aspect which immediately comes out is this, um, the contradictories which, which coexist in this extraordinary personality. Mm -hmm. He would often, if anybody said, you are God or an incarnation of God, he would deny it and would, he would say, don't say such things. You should not say such things. And yet, he actually said, a number of times, and we have testimony, in fact, um, we have actually audio recording of Swami Abhedananda, he, who says that how many times I have heard him say, he who was Rama, he who was Krishna, is in this, is in this body, Rama Krishna. And uh, he openly declared a number of times that he was an incarnation of God. Now, it seems to be that an incarnation of God would actually be like this. You would expect an incarnation of God to be both human and divine. So, wouldn't you expect Christ also to be, have been exactly like that? And maybe the statements which you find later on in the Gospel of John, because it's a later Gospel, um, only those statements about his own divinity and his identity with the Father, his easy relationship with the Father, those things have been made more prominent with the passage of time. But my point is, isn't there a possibility, because Christ was extraordinary, like Ramakrishna or like Krishna, uh, that he would have actually said such things, both kinds of things, as a human being and also as divine. Mm -hmm. nice. 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 <laughs> nice. <laughs> I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, a, it's a, a, a question that we all ask that's posed from a very interesting point of view, the, the point of view of uh, Sri Ramakrishna. So yeah. that's very, very interesting and wonderful to think about this uh, dilemma, so to speak, from that point of view. The reason that, um, let me start with, by the way, many, many, many years ago, I did go to a Christian seminary. At least some Christians would have thought it was a Christian seminary. That was Union Theological Seminary up the street from <laughs> up on Broadway. A great seminary, actually. But I have not pursued biblical scholarship over the years, so I'm not, uh, I'm not up to date on what they think these days. So with that as a disclaimer, in the Synoptic Gospels, in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, you have Jesus wrestling with the question of who the Messiah is and whether the language of the Messiah ought to be applied to him or not. And it is true 
that you have uh, nicely parallel stories about his uh, responding to, you know, especially to Peter, who's always sort of putting this question, who are you? Um, responding to those questions in different ways. We certainly, there's a nice body of scholarship on how the synoptics reveal how Jesus is wrestling with this question. Certainly, certainly the, uh, the prophecies having to do with the Messiah are very much on his mind, no question about that. But by the time we get to John, or in the community that gives us John, his answers are so pat that uh, he clearly is speaking from on top of a cloud. And that cloud is the cloud of, the, of his believers, after who have made a firm association between him and the Father, and who have seen things specifically in man and God terms. That, I think, is what we do not find in the synoptics. We don't, that doctrine of his being both man and God, you know, that's a third century God doctrine. It came along earlier, but it gets reified in Christian teaching by the time we come to the great consuls of the third, third and fourth century. Um, and, you know, and they rely on John a lot, but I, for me anyway, I, it, the question is open. There are people who take what is written in, in John much more seriously than I do. But to me, it is so... Um, the answers given there are so clearly in tune with the theological um, understandings that the church was trying to come to in later days that it's hard for me to read John without seeing the imprint of the community remembering or trying to struggle with who Jesus was and the answers that they had. So the answers get framed around Father, Son, and so forth. It just, but it, it just doesn't ring with the rest of uh, the Gospels. And the other thing that I think, and this would be interesting in regard to Ramakrishna though, different kind of story, the other thing to keep in mind is, the, is a corpus that we call the Q corpus. These are the teachings of Jesus, where uh, critical scholars, the higher scholarship on the Bible, has tried to isolate the collections of Jesus' sayings that would have been in circulation in the early church and that are then behind or used by the authors of the Gospels as they carry them forward. So these, the. We think of that as the, the Q we. Fifty years ago, we thought of that as the, the sort of Q collection of teachings. But they surface, and some of them are in John, but they're notably absent there. It's, it's in the synoptics that we see those, and, and they're in rather different versions, depending on who we're reading. Typically, Luke will read quite differently from Mark, for example. But you can see that they're building on a common core of what his teachings actually were. By the time we get to John, that corpus of teachings is, is just an echo. So I do think there's rather a difference in this, but we don't have Jesus to defend himself here yeah. or a scholar of the Gospel of John. So just take it as a sort of question from my point of view, and maybe you can get someone to engage these questions uh, on some Sunday morning. Okay. I should be there if so. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. Thank you. I'm Ranjit Mitra from New Jersey. My question is, is this Bhakti Yoga Bhakti that you're talking about, is it unique in India or Hinduism, or is it in all the religions, including Abrahamic religions, and in contemporaneous religions, do we find any seedlings, or where is the God considered an autocratic or a dictator, omnipotent, omniscient person? or non-person uh, versus that in India, the Bhakti Yoga, where the God is considered somebody to love, or devotion, uh, and is everywhere. Oh, that's my basic questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mitra. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to answer it in general terms, uh, except to say that I tried to introduce myself as a Bhakta, as a Christian Bhakta. So these are certainly things that have mattered for me, and there certainly have been Christians who know India who have wanted to describe Christian teachings in bhakti terms. So sensing the analogy is, has, certainly is a part 
of the history of Indian Christianity and all of us Christians who are, I say us Christians, oh my gosh, will you see what kind of Christian I am, no good at all, uh, who have met India. And the one thing I would say, and it has to do especially with Islam, we know that, uh, especially in North India, by contrast to South India, that the range of, uh, of uh, the, the presence of Muslims, well, no, I want to start that, that sentence again. Muslims have certainly been active in South India, especially on the Kerala coast, since the 8th century. So the story goes back very far. But it's, it's clear that the Muslim presence, the presence of Muslims in, broadly speaking, the Deccan and North India, uh, leading up to, we were talking about the Mughal times, is a massive presence. So we have inside the, inside the literature, you could say, a bhakti, we have figures like Rahim and Ras Khan in North India who clearly f come from Muslim backgrounds and in the case of Rahim was actually a high official in the Mughal, uh, in the Mughal administration singing songs to Krishna, actually. Without, without giving up on their their Muslimness at the same time, the very words that are used uh, with a surdas, it's almost entirely Indic vocabulary with very few Persian words. Once we go back to the 16th century poems themselves, whereas with a poem like with someone like Raskhan or Kabir or Raidas or even Tulsidas, the extent of uh, of Muslim, that's to say, Perso-Arabic vocabulary is very great. So I think for North India, in any case, the sort of emergence of bhakti as a movement, or at least whatever is going on there in the 16th century, is very much happening in conversation with Muslims. Um, whether then, then of course, it comes to be claimed as a Hindu idea, and the story of the bhakti movement is a Hindu story, really. But the roots out of which it springs are far more, far more than Hindu. So it's a complicated question, and I'm afraid it's a complicated answer. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh. So this is the man who was sentenced to come here by his daughter. <laughs> I'm Bhavani Mukherjee, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, your lecture, as I understand, it uh, talks about the history of the uh, bhakti movement. Uh, and you are concentrating on the concept of going to the history on the basis of the manuscript that you've been able. But in the traditional Indian uh, culture, in the ancient Indian culture, there's a thing called Shruti. Uh, the one that is transmitted, uh, the knowledge is transmitted from one another without going through the manuscript. Now, does that have any connotation to the whole concepts? That's the question. Thank you, Mr. Mukherjee. This is a very important question. What's so good about manuscripts, right? And let's not forget about the, the herd tradition. The problem in doing history, I mean, no question but that what is heard is important. So let's, let's stop at a couple moments along that road. One is the question of uh, the Veda, um, the authors of the Veda saying that it should not be written down. It should not be written down because mistakes could be made. And in fact, it should not be learned by students at a point where they have their, where their heads have been formed. Rather, it should be learned before they're able to think so that they just repeat the mantras exactly as they are and can't make a mistake, can't allow their critical faculties to uh, mess up the actual structure of the mantras. Their critical faculties might be impaired in some way. Certainly mine are. So that's a great tradition. But it did, at a certain point, the Veda did begin to be written down even so. I think in some way Veda is a special class, however, of uh, utterance, and the fact that it's marked off as Shruti um, uh, honors that fact. It goes together with a tradition of memory, of memory learning that is rigorous and that has existed now for thousands of years. With bhakti we have a different situation, I think. 
We have a much more uh, widely shared musical tradition. That doesn't mean, of course, that, uh, that it is less important in any way. It may mean that it's more important. But it does ask different kinds of historical questions. So let me take an example. I've studied more closely the manuscripts having to do with the Surdas tradition than any other. And by contrast to Mirabai, we have manuscripts for Sur that actually go back into the 16th century, presumably his own century, and quite a number in the 17th. What we find, and those would be recordings, you could say, or manuscript versions of performed songs. So I think it's unlikely that we have Surdas you know, sitting at a desk, not because he's blind, I think he probably wasn't blind until late in life, not sitting at a desk and writing, oh, now here's a good poem, let's set it to music, but rather these poems are emerging in musical settings and they have ragas associated with them. But the problem is that in the earliest manuscript, which we're very lucky, 1582, it shows that it is based on other manuscripts. So already we have a manuscript that is a composite manuscript. If you look for a given poem there and try to find out in what rag was it sung, you may well find that it was sung to more than one raga. So if we're thinking of the authority of the oral tradition, we have to account for the fact that people are singing Surdas poems in different ways already in the 16th century, his own century. So that's a problem from the side of Raga. It doesn't mean that the herd tradition is not important. It just means that it's more various than we might think. And the second problem has to do with the actual words of the songs. They too vary. And if you study them closely, you can see how in a certain version, it clearly was recorded, so to speak, from real sound. And we have a singer who probably couldn't remember what the actual word that he once was told was, so he supplies a simpler word in its place. It makes for a less powerful poem, but it may well be the poem that was then carried forward in the tradition, in part because it's simpler, it's easier to master. So the general story of the transmission of the Surdas corpus is that the poems get simpler over the years. Okay, so that's a sung tradition, but I would think that the manuscripts here give us an indication of earlier stages where the poems were actually more complicated. We may not be able to get back to the original, but it's only the manuscripts that allow us to ask this question in an informed way for an earlier period of time. So I want to say, Mr. Mukherjee, your question is an extremely important one. It's sort of the, the question of music is the most important question. But the conditions of our knowledge about the past, as when we look at written sources, force us to ask these kinds of questions about the sung tradition. Let me tell one story about Mirabai. Um, famously, as we've seen, we don't have a very good corpus of early poetry for Mira. Maybe some of you would know that the great um, singer and figure Indira Devi, uh, who uh, established with um, a center in Pune for the singing of Mirabai poems, she said that Mirabai appeared to her personally and sang for her the songs that, as she really sang them back in the 16th century. And why did she have to do that? Because, said Mirabai to Indira Devi, because people have remembered my songs in such different ways, and you know, I just want to get you straight on how they should be sung. Well, who knows? But to me, this sounds like a response on the part of Indira Devi to the embarrassment of the manuscripts. She wants to be able to channel Mirabai for her own singing and for the sake of those who would study singing from her. And I, I know a wonderful person, maybe. But to me it seems, I mean, who knows what Indira Devi heard or what she believed about what she heard. But to me, if the manuscripts don't give a, a good indication let me start the sentence again. It's a lovely story of how the 
sung tradition is trying to respond to the embarrassment of the manuscripts by revalidating the sung tradition and saying, no, this is the real thing. But it takes dreams to do it. <laughs> Sir. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Krishan, and uh, I really thank you for your wonderful lecture. Uh, it really made me think the importance of history in our modern life, and not so importance of history in the lives of great bhaktas you mentioned. Uh, based on your lecture, I find that a lot of bhaktas were not that much interested in writing their history. My question is, would that relate to the stages of a bhakta, saguna and nirguna worship? Uh, given that when you worship the saguna god with characteristics, you have history and past, you know who you are, where you are from, and you feel like you have to write history. But when you worship Nirguna, you merge with the existence itself, and you no longer have any history of your own. You are one with uh, the existence. So does that relate to the fact that we don't have that much history of the great bhaktas? Well, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> your name is Krishan? Yeah. Huh. Um, So if we think of, um, of Mirabai as a good example of a Saguna Bhakta, and if we think of Kabir, let us say, as a good example of a Nirguna Bhakta, I mean really extreme over there on the Nirguna side of things, uh, you know, famous for yelling to the Kazi, you know, what's that book you're dealing with? <laughs> Give it up, you know, and then he says the same thing to the pundit. You know, just, oh, terrible. So if we think of those two as a sort of one archetypal nirguna bhakta and one archetypal saguna bhakta, what could we say about their life stories uh, as we look back on them? I think in neither case, in neither case, do we know that the saint himself or herself was interested in shaping an autobiography. We don't really know that. What we know is how people responded to this person if they knew him. The story of uh, Mirabai is well known to many, many people, but the story of Kabir is also quite well known. And uh, I don't think that the Mirabai story is more definite uh, in its outlines than the Kabir story. It's just that it's a different story. So when Kabir says, you know, they both go on trips. Mirabai, we were saying, we don't know. Oh, did she go to Banaras or did she go to Brindavan? If she went to both places, we don't have any account of how she got from one to the other. So it's a kind of a mess. Um, we don't know. As for Kabir, though, we do have this very important story about where he went. And the story goes that he was living in Banaras all his life and that he made a trip at the end of his life to Magar. That is the question. Exactly that is why he went to Magahar. Because you know, he just went somewhere so that he could get out of Banaras. And it's a real Nirguna story. You know, he doesn't want to be associated with this great place of tradition at all. No, the Lord is Nirguna. He doesn't have those gunas of Banaras anywhere in his personality. But the story of how he left Banaras to go to this God-forsaken place, that story is just as vivid as the story of Mira by going whichever place you want her to go to. So I don't know. Um, these were with Kabir. Maybe I should just stop there. The stories are, it seems to me, are, are just as vibrant no matter which side of the Nirguna or the Saguna uh, divide you find yourself on. And uh, maybe your question would be, well, should we even have stories? Isn't that somehow wrong to what truth really is? But, um, but when you sing a lullaby to your daughter or, you know, speak to her before she goes to bed. Don't you tell her a story? And those stories really do live with us. Sometimes they, uh, sometimes they 
uh, they give us access to truths that we don't have access to in other ways. Well, just, but would that be the final truth? Ah, but yes, well, you might not think so. <laughs> Thank you. We'll call it up later. Um, Thanks for your question. I've, I've got... Uh, He's back. I'm, I'm back. He's back. <laughs> We've got news that the food is ready, but... Oh, oh. but... but um, that trumps everything, and sorry to use the word. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, your most recent... Uh, your, your work that, uh, is on uh, Mirabai and Kabir and Surdas. And your most recent work, you've been concentrating on Surdas. Just tell us your favorite Surdas story. Uh. Well, there are a lot of them. Uh, the one that comes to mind has to do with the Emperor Akbar, since we've been talking about Mughals. And it's a story that is told not just about Surdas, but about many other bhaktas. So we can ask already, uh -huh, is this really a story about an individual person or not? The story is very simple, that Akbar, as he's traveling through Matra, hears of Sur's reputation, and he, uh, he wants to hear him sing. So, you know, he sends somebody, and he gets Sur to come, and... Suur gives a lovely, I'm sure Tansen is there, and Suur gives a, a lovely performance for, uh, for Akbar. He, he sings him a pad. And then Akbar says, we'll, we'll sing one about me. And at that point, Surdas draws the line. <laughs> he said, buddy, I didn't come here to sing about you. I came to sing about the Lord. <clears throat> so there's one story. And another story has also to do with Akbar, where Akbar is so impressed with the singing that he says, well, geez, what can I give you? How many villages do you want? You need an income and so forth. He says, you can give me one thing. Give me the gift of letting me get out of here. Okay, <laughs> right? I just want to go back to live with the bhaktas and not be with you all the time. It's a wonderful set of stories. I love the fact that he's remembered as Mirabai is, as others, as actually having had contact with the Mughal emperor. It's a sort of, it's an acknowledgement that politics matter in these stories, but they matter in an indirect way. That to engage, we use the awful word Trump, to engage with our own sort of political situation is very important, but it's not, it's not the only truth that we have about ourselves. Thank, Thanks. You. Thank you very much.